Good morning. How many of y'all are actually thinking about going to law school? Just considering it? Uh, I majored in political science, and quite honestly, when I got out, I you know, had no aptitude for math, no aptitude for science, and there wasn't that much left to look into. Uh, I went to Millsaps College in Jackson, Mississippi, got out in 1971, came out here to SMU Law School, graduated in 74, went to work for the district attorney's office in the fall of 74, stayed there eight and a half years. Uh, in September of this year, I would have been practicing law for 40 years, and that's hard for me to imagine. Uh, I, I've lost count somewhere along the way, but it's somewhere at or near 518 criminal jury trials that I've had over the course of that time, uh, and that includes death penalty cases. Uh, I am not going to give an anti law school uh, lecture, but I am going to be realistic about it. When I started in 1974, we were told there were too many lawyers. Uh, studies are printed periodically in the New York Times. I think there was an article there about two years ago that said, that would have been, I guess, 2011, that that year they figured out there were 44 thousand law school graduates and 26,000 plus got jobs. Uh, it used to be, at least from an economic standpoint, if you had a law school degree, you were going to make a really, really, really good living. Uh, nowadays, the landscape out there has somewhat changed. If you graduate in the top half or the top of your class, and when I say top, I'm talking about top 10% law review, there are still wonderful opportunities out there. Uh, one of my son's roommate's girlfriend uh, just graduated from the top of her class at Baylor, uh, and I think her starting salary at one of the big firms downtown was $165,000 to start. But for every one person that gets out of law school that starts at that level, there are eight others that are struggling to get by. Uh, it's not like you see on television. Not everybody has a corner office on the 68th floor with an unlimited expense account and investigators and paralegals at every turn. Uh, it's not all glamorous. Uh, but on the other hand, if you make the grind, if you get out, even if you don't want to practice law, it teaches you to think and makes you wonderfully attractive to all kind of business opportunities. My, neither one of my two older children We've got one 28, one 26, and one that's 22 about to graduate. Neither one of the older two professed any interest in going to law school. My youngest one broached the subject with me once. I didn't encourage him. I didn't discourage him. Uh, I just know that those of us that are my age, when we get together and talk, say to ourselves, I wouldn't want to be starting now. Uh, when I started, there was, it was a profession. Uh, everybody treated everybody fairly decently. It's now a business. Uh, and I think one of the reasons that it is, is because of advertising. When I got out of law school, advertising was taboo. Nobody would consider doing it. It was beneath a lawyer to advertise. Nowadays, if you aren't advertising and you haven't mastered the business end of the practice of law, you are dying on the vine. I mean, you hear ads on radio, you see billboards, internet. People have to spend a lot of money, and I'm talking about the big law firms. 
spend a lot of money to have people that do nothing but monitor the market. You know, produce websites, update websites, throw money at search engines. Uh, in, I got out of the DA's office in April of 83 and started private practice representing people that were accused of crimes. Uh, I started a partnership with a law school buddy of mine about 1989. He was the first person to advertise. He was the first person in Dallas to do a Yellow Page ad. He was the first person in Dallas to do direct mailings to people that were arrested, got the jail printout list and sent out letters. Uh, and for a while, he was making, probably a while, I'll say probably 25 years, he was making, you know, $400,000, $500,000 a year off advertising. Now, you've got to factor in to, to get that phone ringing, you've got to spend money to, to make that happen, and Yellow Page ads are not inexpensive. Go look at a Yellow Page phone book now and look at the number of lawyers advertising. You know, they don't just put their name and their phone number. There's no shortage of time that goes in or expense that goes in on making them marketable, making them appealing, uh, and it has diluted the effect of the advertising, quite honestly, unless you are staying ahead of the curve with internet, with search engines and things of that nature. Uh, the big law firms, and I regularly are friends, hunt, play golf, vacation, with guys that are now senior partners in some of the big firms down there. I never had, I, I was solidly entrenched in the mediocrity of my law school class. I wasn't law review, I wasn't top, uh, and you know, those guys were. And back when you'd go visit them when they were young, right out of law school, everybody had the big walnut paneled offices, oriental rugs, you know, artwork on the walls, you know, just lavish. Nowadays, you go in one of those same law firms and it's cubicles. It's, uh, you know, they have downsized. Uh, if you aren't producing, you're gone. You could be a 30-year partner, and if your area of law takes a downturn because of the economy, they will jettison you like bad garbage. Not a lot of lawyers. So you either produce or you're gone. Uh, and getting a start in some of those firms is there's a direct correlation between how high you are in your law school class and whether or not you're ever going to get an interview. So uh, if, if you can produce at that level intellectually, then you're not going to have a problem. Uh, if your dad or your father-in-law or mother-in-law is CEO of some Fortune 500 company, you're not going to have a problem. But if you're a Joe Smith and you're in the middle or the bottom half of your class and your dad doesn't run some one-horse town somewhere, it's, it's going to be a struggle to get out there and make, make it. Uh, the advertising, my partner, I told you, was making all that money for that length of time. It started steadily declining about the last eight to ten years of his practice, so it got down to the last year. The amount of money he was spending to try to get in the business basically equaled the amount of money he was bringing in. I mean, it was down around fifty, fifty to sixty thousand dollars. So it was basically a wash. He was working for free, and he finally decided, "Hey, he's had enough. He'd educated his kids, didn't need a whole lot to live. Be just as happy running a bait shop in Port Aransas." He just walked out, turned out the lights, and said bye. Uh, great guy, but uh, it's things come and things go. Uh, and another thing you need to consider, uh, law school, when I was there, uh, fortunately my dad's federal pension was still paying for my education, but, and so I never saw the check, but I don't think it was, it was, it was much over $1,800 a semester and we weren't charged by the hour, 
So, you know, I could take 18 to 21 hours a semester knowing I was going to drop two courses at exam time because I didn't, you know, I couldn't, you couldn't keep that caseload up, but you needed to have those courses because you knew they were going to be on the bar exam three years from then. So I had the luxury of being able to do that. Now it's not that way. They charge by the hour and it's a lot more difficult to spread yourself where you'd like to to be in a better position to, to take the bar exam. But the debt, I mean, it's 100000 plus, I think, to go to SMU Law School now. And uh, again, if you've got that guarantee that you're going to be editor of the Law Review and you're going to get one of those jobs, uh, it's worth it. Uh, if not, I mean, economic reality needs to set in and you need to figure out, can I tote that note? And uh, how long is it going to take me to, to, to make that up and, and pay it off? Again, it's not a pretty side of the, the business or profession, whatever you want to call it, but it's a reality that you need to consider. And I'll just tell you honestly, I play golf regularly with a bunch of doctors. They're, they would, If they were giving you a lecture on going to med school, you would be hearing a lot of the same stuff that I'm telling you now about med school and the grind and the red tape and the paperwork and the government taking all your money. Uh, something else that's changed dramatically, and I think if I sat down and thought about it, there have probably been at least three or four phases or changes that clearly are delineated in the length of time that I've been practicing. And one of them clearly is, is social change. When I started down at the DA's office, you start off as a misdemeanor prosecutor. You're trying DWIs. You know, back then, uh, your jury panels were pretty much all white. The lawyers were pretty much all male. You go down there now and there is a major marketed diversity as well as it should be. At least half the lawyers that you run into at the DA's office are practicing or female and the jury panels now to a large extent look like a United Nations meeting. And the diversity has done wonders for the system uh, by and large, so it's, it, that's all regarded quite honestly as positive for the education, for the opportunities that it provides for everybody. But in 1974, when I started picking juries and, and trying cases down there, let's just take one thing that we're all familiar with, DWIs. Okay, the biggest problem I had as a prosecutor trying to select a jury in a DWI case uh, was the, you know, a lot of times it's younger college age, young professionals, and half of your jury panel would be sitting out there going, gosh, isn't he or she cute? Look, his feet barely hit the floor. I bet he could get in the movies for half price. You know, they didn't want anything bad to happen to somebody accused of DWI because the other half of them were thinking, but for the grace of God, go I. And so, we had a burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, and then we had a social burden of proof that was sort of ingrained in society back then that, you know, DWIs, they didn't intend it, they didn't want it to happen, uh, gosh, couldn't they just follow them home type of mentality. And what's caused all that to change? MAD. And I'm not saying that negatively, but that's what's caused it to change. Uh, Society's tolerance, society's view of drinking and driving has done a 180. Uh, in 1978, when I started trying some of the heavier felony cases down there, and you were trying an intox manslaughter, a jury panel, because you'd get to talk to them and you'd get to ask them what their thoughts were about certain aspects of the procedure and law so you could more intelligently make your strikes as to who you wanted on your jury and who you didn't want on your jury. You would get questions like this, well gosh, if they didn't really intend to do this and they didn't mean it, uh, you're really trying to send them to the penitentiary. And that was markedly different from if you're trying a case down there with a guy that walks in on a video camera and lays a 7-Eleven employee down behind the counter and pumps two rounds in the back of his head, a jury, same jury would see a big difference in those two scenarios. Guy or girl has one or two drinks too many, 
has an accident that they didn't intend, and the unfortunate result of that, somebody died. And the person that goes in the 7-Eleven store and shoots somebody in the back of the head. You go down there today representing a citizen accused of involuntary manslaughter or intoxication assault, and you start asking those same questions as a defense lawyer trying to defend that citizen accused, and you ask this question, how many of you, yourself, a loved one, or a close personal friend has been the victim of a drunk driver? And if you've got a panel of 75 people out there, I can promise you 20 or more are going to raise their hand. And they have no sympathy. Some of them are extremely bitter. It has caused a lot of pain. The tolerance for that that existed back in the late 60s, 70s is gone. And the gap that existed between the good old boy, one for the road, didn't mean it, didn't intend it, productive citizen, pays taxes, young kid, bright future from a good family, all the reasons that we had problems with back in the mid to late 70s, those are gone. There is no gap between the person that goes out and kills somebody while impaired and the person that goes in 7-Eleven and shoots somebody in the back of the head as far as most jurors are concerned. There was a time back about five or six years ago, I don't think anybody has tried more of these cases to juries than I have in the last 20 years. And I had a, just as it worked out at that particular time, five people that were accused of intoxication or assault or intoxication manslaughter. And three of them were females under the age of 23, and I had two males that were just barely 22. Money was no object with any of these people that I had representing. One of them was a paralegal at a big downtown law firm uh, one of them was a, a, a senior at SMU. Uh, one of them was a, 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 a waitress. She was an alcoholic. The other killed her best friend driving home one evening, hit a telephone pole. Every one of those people went to the pen except one except one. And if I rolled out and had time to roll out all the fact situations, you'd be asking yourself, how did he avoid it? And sometimes stars align. But if you want to look at social evolution and social change, you don't need to look any further than that one offense, that one category of offense to see how things have changed. And another sort of what to us in the industry is laughable. In 1984, January 1, 1984, was the, you could not get deferred adjudication, which is a non-conviction type of disposition for a DWI, because the legislatures down there decided that we're going to get tough on crime, particularly tough on DWIs, so we're going to make it where everybody gets a conviction it stays on everybody's record forever because that's the way that we'll deter it. The message will go out and that will stop people from going to bars and drinking and stop them from thereafter getting in their cars and driving home. We'll just make it painful. We'll make it so it's like a scarlet A on their forehead and having to deal with. And what it has done and what it has finally dawned on people is that it has created a major league, all pro, hall of fame glut in the system. Because now if you walk, somebody comes in your office and at any given time I probably have between 50 and 70 active pending DWI cases. And you ask a client, I do everyone that comes in my, my office, I say wave a wand, have this matter over, 
how do you want it to end? I do that because their answer to that question will tell me how realistic their appreciation is for the circumstances that they're in. And everybody, I've almost stopped asking it for DWIs because the answer is always the same. I don't want it on my record. I don't want it on my record. Now what have judges found out? Judges have found out that their dockets are all backed up because everybody's setting a DWI for trial. And the, the, the DAs are finding out that what they're doing is they're trying their least aggravated cases. Because if you've got somebody that, uh, you know, they now got in-car videos, and, and so if you've got somebody that Ray Charles can clearly see is drunk, you know, falls out of their car, throws up in the police car, has got a gin bottle in his back pocket. Those cases don't get tried. It's the, you know, college kid. It's the young professional. Uh, those cases get tried. And those people have money and their daddies have money to hire good lawyers. So the DA's office is getting their brains beat in because they've got some young kid six months out of law school trying a case against somebody that's been doing it for 30 years. And they're not winning, if they're winning 50% of the cases, they're doing good. And so what they decided several years ago is, okay, let's get a bill through the legislature that allows us basically to decriminalize some of the DWI cases. That is, if somebody gets a DWI and they go through a certain program, then it would be kind of like deferred adjudication. You could avoid having the conviction on your record. And a conviction's huge. I used to tell people all the time, avoiding a DWI conviction is about a $50,000, you know, benefit for you because you're, you know, Ross Perot will have a hard time paying your automobile liability premiums for the next seven or eight years. Fine, court costs, uh, surcharges, legal fees, probation fees, it, it adds up real quickly. Uh, so they decided that what they do to eliminate the backlog and sort of give people an opportunity to help themselves, and I'll get to the war on drugs versus rehab in just a minute. But they decided that they would give people some incentive. They would try to get people that aren't, weren't going to be hardcore offenders, just had a one-time bad night, and give them some incentive to get treatment, to get education, and to decriminalize it so it wouldn't be on their record forever. They tried to get that through the legislature. Now, let me tell you what the legislative thinking is. Okay, you're on a committee that's going to vote that bill out to be voted on. If you vote that out, then what you have guaranteed yourself is you will have an opponent in the next election because somebody is going to say, ha, legislature so-and-so is soft on crime. Look what he does. He's for people to drink and drive. You know, he's against tough enforcement of DWI laws. So, no legislature was going to vote that out, even though the, you know, the, the criminal community, and when I say criminal community, I'm talking judges, prosecutors, and defense lawyers were all saying, this is a good, good idea, this is a good plan, this will benefit everybody. Legislatures aren't thinking about what benefits everybody, all they're thinking about is what benefits them. You know, survival is the number one instinct for all living organisms, and survival for a legislature is re-election. So, the people that were trying to get this through thought better about it, so what did they do? They went and encouraged MAD. They educated MAD on the problem. And they got MAD behind the concept of, hey, legislators, we want this. We want this to get through. We want this to be passed. It will benefit us and our agenda. Never made it out of committee because of the same factor. They don't want to put their name on passing something that's going to be used against them. So, you know, you don't want to watch sausage being made. You don't want to watch legislation being made because they don't do the right thing for the right reasons. Uh, I mean, how many of you, does anybody in this room think the war on drugs is working? Okay, but what did people want to hear back in the 70s, back in the 80s? We're going to be tough on drugs. 
and, and juries were the same way. I can remember trying a case, not particularly proud of it, looking back on it, but I can remember trying a case probably back in the late 70s where a guy got caught possessing one cap of heroin. 99 years is what a jury gave him. 99 years. Now, I'm sure he had some criminal history, but nothing that would warrant 99 years for a cap of heroin. But that's what the people wanted to hear. Maybe in your lifetime, but I doubt it, there will be a politician that will get elected on, hey, vote for me, I want to rehabilitate everybody. People don't want to hear it. They do not want to hear it. But you go down the court system today, and while I'm thinking about this, I will make this offer. I make this offer every time I speak to a high school group. I make this offer every time I speak to young adults. If you want to figure out or find out what really goes on down there at that courthouse on a day-to-day -day basis, and you've got the time, then I want you to call me. Just about every semester I have some high school kid from Richardson that gets assigned to me as an intern, somebody's thinking about going to law school. So people down at that courthouse are used to seeing me walk those halls with somebody tagging along. So if you want to go down to the courthouse for a day, for a week, however long you want to do it, and follow me around, walk where I walk, listen to the conversations I have in back hallways, courtrooms with judges, prosecutors, probation officers, other defense lawyers, uh, see what really goes on down there on a day-to-day -day basis, give me a call. All you'll have to do is meet me in my office at 730 and, and we're off. And I'll tell you right now. Political professors do that too? I'm sorry? Could political science professors do that too? Yes, yes. I would love to do that. And I'll tell you right now, wear tennis shoes because it'll be a track meet down there in the morning, on any given morning, I've probably got 25 to 40 things I'm doing, trying to get done between 8.30 and noon. But uh, getting back to this war on drugs uh, and, and the rehab, they have finally figured out and studies have finally showed them that it's cheaper and more effective to take a person that's got a drug or an alcohol problem and try to cure them of the problem than it is to put them in jail. Now, the, the ante on that has changed if somebody is injured in the process, like the DWI in Tox's assault. But if you've just got a guy that's a drunk and he's not injuring anybody, or you've got a guy, girl that's an addict and they're not robbing somebody, then there is a large amount of sympathy, there is a large amount of resources available to attempt to deal with them. The problem that you've got is they can't tax you enough to generate all the funds that it would be necessary to rehabilitate all the people that need rehabilitation. There is a substance abuse treatment facility inside the penitentiary system. And if you've got somebody that needs to do that, uh, in Dallas, for example, now it's not the same for every county, but in Dallas, if you were to send your client to what is called Safe P, which is a six-month program inside the penitentiary, but your unit you go to is one where everybody's there for drug treatment. They're not putting you in with murder, rapers, and robbers. You're there for drug treatment. And you'll stay there as long as you're working the program. Uh, if you get down there and you have a to hell with you attitude, then they'll just roll you into the general population. But as long as you're down there working the program, it's a six-month program. After you get out, it's a six-month sober living, halfway house type of environment in an attempt to deal with your addiction because what it's patently obvious to everybody that works this program, works the system, is if you take somebody that's addicted and you give them a jail sentence, they're still going to be addicted when they get out. And so you haven't helped yourself, you've just delayed the problem, you know, for whatever time period that they're going to be in jail. And a lot of the courts down there now, the judges, they have programs, special courts for prostitutes, uh, drug addicts, alcoholics, you, you name whatever mental conditions they are, they've got programs for that, but the bed spaces are so limited. In Dallas, it's a four-month wait to get into safe pay. 
four months. So you sit in jail for four months waiting for that bed space to open up. But, you know, those programs, I've seen them work where parents that had money to send their kids to Hazleton, to Betty Ford, to these year-long wilderness programs, money was no object. Kids weren't getting it. You know, they weren't ready. And so the little darling finally does something that they can't write a check big enough to cover, and they end up sending them to Safe P. And I don't know whether it's the, in, you know, in psychiatric circles they refer to it as aversion therapy. And I don't know whether the aspect of sitting in jail for four months and then being in the pen for six months makes it where they don't want to go back or gives them some outside incentive to change. But that appears to be working by and large where no other programs and certainly the war on drugs, tough on crime, uh, uh, it just wasn't working. At the courthouse, we have an adversarial process. That is, the district attorney's office represents the citizens accused, and uh, they're there basically to take the bad guys off the street. Those of us that, on my side, you know, we are trying to, uh, one, see that the laws are followed and are followed correctly, and then defend somebody to the extent they have a defense, either as a matter of fact, or, or matter of law. Uh, where is the balance? And I'm going to tell you, there's no bright line balance. There are some counties that it's very easy to practice law in. They understand it. They get it. They don't sweat the small stuff. If you've got a crime, a, you know, a, a Ford script case, they view it like, hey, your guy's got an addiction problem. Let's see what we need to do about that not like he's the son of Sam of prescription crime and, and try to, you know, put him in, in the pen forever. But you go to other counties with the exact same fact situation and something that's treated as a minor problem here is treated as a death penalty case in that particular county. Uh, and you, you, you need to understand that probably 90 Lower 90% of all the cases that get filed down there get resolved as some other way than by trial. They either get pled out to what they're charged with, they get pled out to something that's reduced, or the case gets dismissed. You know, so 7% of the cases actually go to trial, and out of that, in Dallas County, quite honestly, there are at least 50% of the cases that go to trial shouldn't be going to trial. You've got poorly trained, poorly supervised people that make poor judgments about what's serious and wh what's a crime and what isn't, and sometimes you get stuck having to, to, to try those cases. Uh, judges down there are supposed to follow the law. That's what you'd like to think that they're there for. They're there called balls and strikes. Why we still have in 2014 political affiliation attached to a person who's running for a judge is beyond me, but it's, you know, they'll probably outlaw deer hunting with dogs before they'll, you know, get around to changing that. Political process, I mean, the court system really has no place for the political process. You, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you ought to be interpreting and, and, and you know, following the same law. Uh, but you've got a judge down there, for example, I've got some matters that need to be addressed with a judge or judges down there right now. I am no more and haven't been for the last two or three months thinking about going to a judge prior to March the 4th and asking them to do something that would benefit my client. For example, you've got a guy in jail that really needs a bond reduction for pretty obvious reasons and, you know, May, March 5th may be a good time to go in there and broach that issue or subject with the judge. Today ain't the day to go do that because they don't want to read about themselves on the front page of the metro section. Uh, again, so you're a lot of times caught between, okay, are you going to do the right thing or are you going to do the politically safe thing? And unfortunately, there are a lot of those people down there uh, will do the 
politically safe thing time after time after time. They've got no spine, they've got no balls, they're just there to draw a paycheck and, and hopefully get reelected. Uh, and these are the same judges that will go out and ask for campaign contributions from lawyers that practice in their court. What's wrong with that picture? And another, talk about problem with the system is you've got, you know, when I was coming through and I was looking for a job, that job application had one line on it, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And if the answer to that question was no, and you didn't have active murder warrants out of Butte, Montana, then you're probably going to get that job. Nowadays, you've got, I think, I file an expunction probably once a week for somebody. An expunction is desired, is designed to clean somebody's criminal record and put them back in the same position that they were in prior to getting arrested. That is, they've been found not guilty, the case was dismissed for some reason, and the legislature says, well, this person shouldn't have the burden of having to deal with this criminal issue or problem for the rest of their life, so we're going to provide a legal means by which they can get it expunged off their record or erased. Well, at last count, my paralegal told me there are 28 companies out there like publicdata.com that market themselves to Fortune 500 companies and others as, hey, hire us, we will ferret out anything in your prospective employee's background that there is. Because, for example, Dallas County, you get taken to the Dallas County Jail, they sell their arrest records to publicdata.com. And when the people in the legislature wrote the expunction statute, it didn't cover private entities. So, you could get the police agency that arrested you, the district clerk's office, the DA's office, the sheriff's department, DPS, to erase all their stuff, and if somebody can Google you up and it's on the internet somewhere, you paid for an expunction, it's gotten you nowhere. It's gotten you nowhere. So just be aware of the fact that, again, that's one of those things in society where you've got competing interests. You know, somebody wants the right to know, you want the right to keep things where they should have been or you think the law entitles you to be. Uh, I'm going to give you two more examples and then I'm going to shut up and let you all ask whatever questions you all might think important because what I'm telling you, some of you may or may not consider to be important. Uh, jury selection is extremely important down there. And, you know, you can put all kind of explanations on what it is and what it isn't, but the reality of what it is, it's what you're doing, if you're the assistant DA, you've got the burden of proof, you get to go first. What you're trying to do is psychologically manipulate that panel out there to your philosophical perspective on the given case. And it's the same thing for us on this side. We're trying to do the same thing. Now, if you're down there trying a case, and let's just make something that's going to be really unpopular. You've got a client that's accused of sexual assault of a child. Now, what happens on a given day is the jury panel comes up, they come in the jury room, where they may, if you've got a judge that's a good person, and he lets you do a voir dire questionnaire, a juror questionnaire, so that you get their unfiltered thoughts before the psychological manipulation begins, so that you can find out what they're really thinking and their biases and prejudices are, then they're in effect informed by the type of questions you're asking as to what the subject matter of the case is going to be. Otherwise, they're going to get called in the court and the judge is going to say, ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate y'all coming out here today. Y'all are going to be here in a case style, the state of Texas versus Billy Bob. Billy Bob is accused of sexual assault of a child. And you can just see the eyes go from listening to the judge to your client going, you low-life SOB. And so right then and there, you've got the burden of proof. You've got the burden of proof, which is beyond a reasonable doubt as a legal standard, but what else have you just infused into the matter? You've got their bias and prejudice uh, that's in, in sense. So what you've got to do is you've got, as a defense lawyer, you've got to acknowledge and you've got to set these people up by saying, hey, it's a problem. You can't ignore the fact that it's a problem. You can't go home in the evening and turn on the news. You can't pick up a newspaper in the morning. 
You can't listen to the radio where some child's not being snatched off some fourth grade soccer yard and you know they find her four days later in a ditch somewhere in West Texas and she's killed, she's been raped. So if you don't address the weaknesses in your case, that is, it's a serious social problem. It is a nobody's for, well, I'm not standing here because I'm for child abuse. You know, they're against child abuse. I, that doesn't mean I'm for child abuse. What I'm here for is to make sure that the laws are followed and that Billy Bob gets a fair trial. And if your ability to be objective about the facts and circumstances of the case is going to be clouded because you have a bias against this, then if you're going to really be honest and you can take the oath, you know, and you consider the oath important and you're biased, then you ought to raise your hand and say, I couldn't be fair. I could not be fair in the frame of mind I'm in. So you've got, I've got to spend an inordinate amount of my time addressing the issue. The fact that it's a serious social problem doesn't mean that somebody that's merely accused of that should be denied a fair trial. I mean, just think about it in your mindset. If yesterday evening you'd gotten home and your front door had been kicked open and your house had been ransacked and burglarized, and the next morning you've got jury duty and you're called in on a panel and the judge says, folks, thanks for being here. We're, we're going to try Billy Bob over here and he's accused of burglary. You know, how fair are you going to be to Billy Bob that week? You know, and so that's what you're dealing with. And for the same token, you know, the DA's office has some issues and problems. I'm not going to encourage you all to go out and buy a dime bag, but you know, getting a conviction down there on marijuana cases is a problem for them down there. There are a lot of people who don't see it as a crime. And so they've got, they've got to you know, twist this around you know, to, to be able to find a jury that's going to be fair to them. And by and large, here's what they're trying to do. Okay, can y'all, I don't know if y'all can read, see this in the back, I'm going to read it to you. It's dark. A convicted felon runs into a convenience store, takes some items, and then dashes out without paying for them. Okay, how many of y'all think that's a theft offense? Is there anybody that doesn't think that's a theft offense? Convicted felon goes into a place, takes items, doesn't pay for it, runs out. It's a theft, right? John, a 50-year-old medical doctor, is an emergency room surgeon. One night on his way home from the hospital, he witnessed an accident involving a kid on a bicycle in a delivery truck. He stops and attempts to comfort the child. He realizes he needs to stabilize the child with a coal pack and a tourniquet. He sprints into a nearby 7-Eleven, grabs a bag of ice and a bandana, and dashes back to the child without paying for those items. As a 17-year-old, John had a felony criminal mischief conviction for spray painting his initials and those of his girlfriend on a water tower. Okay, so what do we have here? We've got a convicted felon who goes into an establishment, takes items, and doesn't pay for it. How many of y'all think John is guilty of theft? Let's just show hands. Okay, I do this all the time in a lot of my cases where I know the DA is going to try to present one version of the fact situation and my thinking is that a more full view of it will totally render his. Anybody that would raise their hand on that I would automatically cut because if you seriously think that this guy ought to be charged with theft and I got a problem with your thought process just generally and let me just read you what the law would be. Uh, there is a defense called necessity which basically says if if I left it in my truck. If the good that you're trying to accomplish outweighs the bad that you did, then it's, it, what you did is justified. That is, trying to save the life of a child allows you to go in there and take a bag of ice and a bandana. So you're not going to get charged with this offense in Dallas County or Tarrant County. Now, if you're in Ellis County, you're in Denton, you're in Collin County, you're in Smith County, you may get charged. 
but by and large you're not. But again, it goes to show that people have a frame of reference, people have a mindset, and what you're trying to do on the defense side is you're trying to fill in the skeletal facts with enough information that will make them see the case in the light that you want it seen in. And a lot of times, you know, how upset would you be if the DA's office just presented that fact situation and kept these facts from you? That's another thing I'm subtly trying to, to, to set up and suggest. All right, one other thing, and I'm going to shut up. Uh, I represented a guy about a year and a half ago. I got a call from a golfing buddy. It seems I get a lot of my business from there, thank goodness. But he had a friend who had just been arrested and charged with injury to a child. And the facts are basically this. Uh, my guy's name's Andrew. Andrew and his wife, college educated, really good jobs, young couple, struggled to get pregnant, finally had their first child. And Andrew, through the whole process, had been really supportive. Uh, we got a ton of letters from nurses and doctor's offices that they visited and visits that he had because his wife worked and uh, he was a hands-on dad. And they'd had this child, the child was about three and a half months old and wife was fixing to take her first business trip since the birth of the child. So she got up that morning, was getting ready. He got up, devoted his time to the child. She left. He's bathing the child, and he notices some discomfort in the child's leg. And, you know, calls the wife, says, hey, I think he was in the process of doing a videotape of the child to be able to transmit to his wife so she would have it. It's the kind of guy he was, nice guy. And, uh, you know, calls his wife, hey, I think we've got this issue with the child's leg. So he calls the hospital and says, hey, I'm bringing the child in. I think there's an issue, a problem here. Do you all have x-ray equipment that'll take care of a three and a half month old child? And they assured him that they did. So he packs up the kid and tries to get it to the hospital as quickly as he can. So he rolls in there. They do an x-ray of the child, and the next thing he knows, he's been shuffled down to Children's Medical Center, where there are more x-rays, and pretty soon it starts raining police and Child Protective Services workers. And uh, he subsequently finds out that they have these x-rays have been diagnosed with corner fractures of both wrist, corner fractures of both ankles, a broken right leg, broken ribs, and a uh, collarbone that was, you know, in the healing process. And uh, uh, corner fractures are a medical term that indicates the doctor would testify that corner fractures, you, you would have to take a child's limb and twist it in order to be able to get the kind of break that, that they diagnosed. And I think we pretty much can all agree that somebody that would do that to a child pretty much needs to be just taken out and put in a ditch and shot. Uh, so uh, the police now have a problem because the three and a half month old child can't talk to them and say, who did this? So they've got to start interviewing everybody that had access to the child. Well, they start out with Andrew. And Andrew had a rather irreverent attitude toward the cops, you know, once he figured out that they were looking at him as a suspect. And he basically told them to kiss his rear end. And, uh, you know, I wasn't involved then. He had a civil lawyer, and uh, they wanted him to take a polygraph, and he told them no. Uh, and they subsequently got some doctor to make some statement that they interpreted as being able to put him with the child alone during that time frame where the child's leg was injured because they had to have somebody in exclusive possession of the child at the time an injury occurred in order to be able to legally get there. So they arrest him for injury to a child. And uh, thereafter, shortly thereafter, I get, I get a phone call. Well, the guy comes in, tells me the, pretty much the story that I told you, get the wife in, interview her separately. Believe me, if she thought for a nanosecond that her husband had done that to that child, it, she'd have killed him. Uh, and uh, so it's pretty good indication 
where you've got a non-B-type personality wife that is standing by a husband under those circumstances. But what did I do? Well, I wanted to figure out what the deal was, so I sent him out to my polygraph operator to figure out if he had anything to do with intentionally and knowingly injuring that child or was present when somebody else injured the child. And my polygraph guy is best in the country, past president of the American Polygraph Association, past president of the Texas Polygraph Association, does most of the law enforcement polygraphs here in this area, and I probably have had at least 200 cases dismissed on the strength of his polygraph alone. I'm talking murder, rape, robbery, federal drug conspiracies. He's that good and that well-respected. And uh, flunks nearly everybody I send over to him. Uh, but he calls me after this, so this guy had nothing to do with this. I sent him to that polygraph operator, A, because I know he's good, he's the only one I use, and B, this was another county that will remain nameless. Uh, I knew that that's who they used for their polygraph work. So I take the polygraph up to the assistant DA who has a case who I'd never met before. I'd been told that he was fair, compassionate, and all his cards would be face up on the table, and generally I found him to be that way. But I gave him the polygraph and I could instantly see a markedly troubled look on his face because they had just gotten through using that polygraph operator to solve a rather serious matter they had, and I knew he had a lot of respect for the guy. We, we continue talking, and he has a statement from the doctor, a doctor at Children's Medical, that says, hey, I don't know that I can state with a reasonable degree of medical certainty that the injury occurred to that child during the time frame that you know, Andrew had the child. So, I mean, he's disclosing this to me. Trust me, there are a lot of prosecutors that wouldn't. And so I basically looked back at him and I said, Michael, what are we doing? You can't get past a directed verdict. You know, why aren't we dismissing this case? Well, he might be guilty. And, you know, it might snow, you know, seven feet in the middle of June, but that's not the standard we use here is he might be guilty. What are we doing here? It took me another 14 months, and that wife flying that child. Fortunately, we had a deal where CPS didn't jerk the child out of the home. They let the in-laws and the mother, all of whom were suspects that were never interviewed by the police officers, uh, basically have the child. So we had, I had access to the child. So she flew that child to Houston, New Orleans, Philadelphia, Boston, seeing every expert in the country with regards to what was wrong with that child. And the reports all came back the same. We do not believe these are corner fractures. We believe this is yet some undiagnosed metabolical abnormality. And finally, they found the right expert who mama had some disease, I can't pronounce, Ehlers-Daniels syndrome or something that's hereditary and that causes uh, rickets type situations and basically these people at Children's Medical had just misread, misdiagnosed the child, misread the x-rays. Uh, we had five sets of people that looked at the x-rays that were, you know, uber uh, qualified saying they're not corner fractures. But I'm going to tell you, if this guy had gotten the wrong lawyer or hadn't had money, he'd be doing 20 years in the pen right now. He'd be doing 20 years in the pen because he would have gone to trial they wouldn't, have had the ex they wouldn't have had the child being seen by these experts, and he'd have gotten convicted like that. And so the system's not perfect, and, you know, really all the media wants to put in the paper is those that are, you know, the most horrific examples of failing and not working, I guess, to keep us all on our toes. But there's, there's, there, I could sit here till it got dark and give you example after example after example of both good things that have happened and bad things that have happened. So I'm going to shut up and answer whatever questions anybody might have for the First time we've got left. We just give you a very generous opportunity to do kind of a one-day internship with him. Most of us, quite honestly, be battered if somebody called and wanted to follow us around for a day or two. So it's not, it's, it's not terribly difficult for me to find somebody or find a situation if you wanted to take several days off and just go down there and watch a particularly interesting trial you know I could introduce you to the judge and both sides and say hey you know let this kid in on what's knowing what's going on and and you know they would be happy so generous as old studies show your generation is really going to be in a church as 
far as jobs are concerned, and most uh, people say if you have some type of internship, some type of experience, to kind of separate you is one of the best things you can do uh, for yourself. One other thing, uh, Reed, you mentioned to see, and there's a lot of smart folks in here. Give them a round of applause. There's a lot of talent. Uh, a lot of fine uh, You mentioned the kids who come out the top 10%. I was a plain old kid. I was not the top 10% of anything. Uh, I think I've had a pretty successful career. I saw in the paper just this weekend that Microsoft is no longer recruiting, quote, the top 10%. That they aren't, uh, you know, they're recruiting political science majors. They're recruiting uh, art majors, things like this. Because they said that there's not that high a correlation between the success and the top 10%. Could you comment on that? Well, I, I certainly believe that because I graduated in the bottom half of my law school class. I was a B student in college, so certainly I'd like to think that those of us that are solidly entrenched in that way can, can produce and do well. Uh, again, it's a, a lot of what you do and you'll find is personality driven, it's work ethic driven, uh, and you know, if you you only have one opportunity to, to make a first impression and uh, you know you hit the right interviewer on the right day at the right time and, and, and they perceive you as a go-getter. What you need to understand is that person is looking at you and they're thinking to themselves, is this person going to make me money? Is this person going to be of value to me and my company? Or am I going to look like an idiot hiring him or her simply because I got a letter of recommendation from somebody? David, is there a follow-up study for guys like us, plain old folks, who've gone, I think, to be successful compared to the people who graduate the top 10% of the class after they've been on the job 10 years? I'm sure those studies are done, and I'm sure they're out there and published. I'm sure you can Google them, and I'm sure what they will show is that there is no correlation between necessarily being in the top 10% and how successful you're going to be. What I can tell you is it will open doors on your initial interview and get you job offers and options that the, those of us mainstream are not going to get. So uh, you need to figure out that that's going to happen. I'll never forget the most irritated I got when I was in law school is I interviewed for a summer internship at the Attorney General's office. And at the end of the process, the guy looked at me and said, you know, we would love to hire you, but you're in the bottom half of your class and we're trying to make this an honors program, and so forget it. And, uh, you know, you don't have to hear that more than once or twice to get really pissed off and try to, you know, I've showed them more than once or twice in my career. I can just tell you that since that time. But just, you know, be aware of the fact that you're not going to get, if you're in law school, when uh, the, the major firms come and interview, you're not getting that interview. So you're going to have to find something else that distinguishes you from that person. You know, you're either going to have to be bilingual, you're going to have to have a joint JD, MBA, you're going to have to go out and get an internship somewhere that really makes you look good on paper. Uh, but he's right. You know, I can't remember the last time somebody asked me where I went to law school, what my class rank was, or, you know, they just care whether or not they've got a good reference because you helped, you know, Juan Sanchez out, you know, six months ago on his federal felon with a firearm possession case or something. So... specific due to how Texans views our state constitution and our, you know, uh, how we're supposed to have our you know, Texas creed of you know, liberty, individualism, et cetera, that a coach at a uh, high school was caught sending text messages to a 13-year-old. I saw that on the news last night. You know, that she had sent him you know, a picture of her in their bra, but 
there was nothing explicit in regards to the fact that they were going to meet up for any type of actual rendezvous of any kind. Yet, the judge threw it out based on uh, that being tried for that, since it was communication back and forth, it's a, you know, it, it, it was going to step on his freedom of speech. I mean, it, it what you have, it, is, it does, and it's the thing that, that makes people mad, but the legislature drafts a law, and if the conduct that is committed doesn't fit within what's prescribed in that statute, it's not a crime. I'll tell you something else that, that's, you know, I have probably had 40 airport gun cases in my career where somebody is caught at DFW or Love Field with a gun in their, in their luggage or in their purse. How many of those 40 people do you think have been convicted? Zero. Zero. Every one of them has been not filed, no billed, or dismissed at some point in time because the statute is they have to show that you knowingly or intentionally are trying to bring the gun through the security checkpoint. These are people that have all forgotten, didn't inadvertent, you know, had been in a bag that they hadn't grabbed in, you know, two years. Most of them are CHL holders, uh, had doctors, lawyers, nurses, retired people, school teachers, law students, state legislators, you know, do this. And they, they, they won't change the law. And so you just, all you basically do is put together a two-page letter to the grand jury with a, attach your client's resume to it, put a blue blazer and a pair of khakis on them and send them in there and, and they're going to get no bill every time because they can't, I've had, I've had cops come in and testify. Well, what happened? Well, they're going through the metal detector and we looked at the luggage and saw a gun. And what was the expression on my client's face? He was shocked. He was surprised. Did it appear to you that he was intentionally trying to get the gun through? No, it appeared to me that it was a, an accident. So until they change that, make it a, DWI is a crime that doesn't require a culpable mental state. You don't have to know you're intoxicated. You don't have to intend to be intoxicated. It's no mental state. Until they make a, an offense where, you know, if you're at the airport with a gun, you're guilty, then all those cases are going to get thrown out. They will. Somebody will draft a bill in the next legislature to cover that. But it just, again, most of the legislative statutes that are passed down there, they never bother to call up a prosecutor, a judge, or a defense lawyer and say, hey, can we meet in a room? We've got this concept, this idea about this law we want to pass and get your feedback, get your input on why it might work, why it might not work, what language may need to be included. They pass things down there for political reasons, not for legal reasons. That's why you had the result that just drives people crazy. Like the kid in Fort Worth that killed four people in an automobile accident and not doing any time in jail. You know, the public's outraged. You know, there'll be somebody that will be filing something to limit a judge's ability to do what that judge did with that kid because of the outrage. Why I bring that up is really based on the example that you used of the doctor you know, who had the felony early in his life. If that made it you know, to trial, if it actually got to the point that it was in the courtroom, that's why I said yes, you know, I would consider that theft. Because if it gets to the point that he's being tried for it, okay, Well, but then you, you would get a charge on necessity, and hopefully you would read that and say, exactly. you know. But it's, just, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, information at hand, if it fit, you know, within, you know, whatever the person's being charged for, you know, hopefully, you know, that's what is being tried against. Well, yeah. let, me, let me give you another example. Let's just assume that I'm walking my dog down the street, and I walk by a house, and I look up, and I notice that the house is on fire. And I notice there's a child in a bedroom upstairs crying to get out. And I go and kick that front door in and go up and save that child. Now, I've, I've committed a burglary according to, you know, yeah, 
no, obviously no, yeah. you know. Anybody else? Yes, Gary. I got one for you. All right. You were talking about how these websites are going to pay for some information and so on and so on. I have a situation where uh, uh, years like the show was started back in 95 where uh, me and uh, Don, maybe you can remember, uh, were arrested. But apparently, from what I can gather, he gave them my name. He knew my birth date, obviously address. He was on my phone complex. Um, I didn't know any of this until uh, several years later when uh, after I had to get a post by a police officer stop question, they asked me if I ever went by his name. Uh, I think I started in like 99. That happened in 95 when we were busing together. It wasn't, uh, you know, I just thought, boy, okay, whatever. It wasn't until uh, in like 2007 or 9, somewhere around there, I got stopped by a Missouri trooper who was convinced that I was transporting drugs proceeded to have my wife and me and our three dogs with our car packed out in the cold in the middle of winter, freezing our asses off, and tore apart our car. And then when he finally came up and asked me, uh, he said, you said you've never been in jail? And I said, no. Why are they telling me you have a felony possession now, or conviction now? I don't have a felony anything. Come to find out now, I'm down as an alias for him. He's down as an alias for me. I go pull up any website or anything, and even on my police records, if you pull up the background or anything, it has my own name. When he got in the car, he was looking in my eyes and had to do a physical description of my social security number, called on his personal cell phone with a dispatcher to discuss all this stuff, and finally realized that ain't him. I've called DAs around here. All this, most of the charges of his is out of Tarrant County. There's a couple here named Johnson County for possession of out of Johnson County. I've been flat out told by a DA I have to get a lawyer and go before a judge to fix that screw up. It didn't even come from me. So you're telling me that it is that easy? I can just give anybody's name when I get arrested and now I screwed up their life? Yeah, it's that easy. I, I, put it, I put it this way, right now, uh, I could call 911 and uh, if you and I were living together and say you assaulted me and, and go hit myself in the head against the wall and when the cops show up, if I'm injured and I made that call, you're going to go to jail. See, we were arrested yeah, I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. No, you, you're going to have to... Now, there, there are procedures, because this happens all the time. This happens all the time. Somebody's cousin will give some other cousin's name. And so there is a procedure, at least in Dallas County, where they will allow you to uh, purge, expunge your record, and the sheriff will give you a letter that you can carry around oh, with you. Okay. That's as, probably as good as it's going to get yeah, for you. Get yeah. I yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I cannot free, but... Yeah. No, I'm sorry, but there, there are just some, there's some problems that there's not a solution for, unfortunately. No, I got a solution. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One last real quick question. Kate, anything? Okay, yes. Something like that, doesn't that make for an extremely flawed system? What his described? Yeah, I mean, situations yeah. like that. Yeah, it does. And, and that's perfectly okay. Well, it's not perfectly okay. It's just I don't know if... if, if uh, they arrest. I tell you what, if you can be appreciation on the death penalty, do you really want it? it it's, they're going to put in some data bank all the information that they can get that they think may, to, may later be used to help them get back to where they're trying to get to go. And if you've given a different name, or uh, then they're going to assume that if they come across that name again in the future, there's some database that they can use to link it back up to you where they could do fingerprints or DNA. And the fact that it's somebody else's name and they're totally innocent, uh, they're just going to get trampled. Okay, let's give Reed a round of applause. Thank you very, very much. <clears throat>